Hey guys, welcome back to Marketing Food Online. It's Damien, and then again, again, you guys are having a great day. I do hope. I know that I am. I want to get into eight, eight reasons why your Etsy shop may not be selling products and what you can do to fix that. Uh, specifically here on Marketing Food Online, we discuss product development for food products. But of course, many of these techniques and information can be applied to any type of product. And let's get started. All right, guys, so here we go. So I'm going to go over eight reasons. I want to go eight different things that you really need to address that potentially could be holding you back from making sales on your Etsy store. Um, just a little rundown. I've been on Etsy myself for 11 years. I've sold over 150 plus thousand dollars worth of baked goods and candies that my wife and I do make in our uh, commercially licensed facility. We ship all over the world. We have been fortunate enough to ship to 15 countries and counting just on Etsy alone. We have six stores online and we have created uh, nearly 400 handmade items that we produce out of our shop, and we ship everywhere. Um, so I want to get into what I've learned kind of over the years. When I first started, I knew nothing about Etsy. Um, I didn't know much of anything about tips and tricks and such. It was really just a hit or miss and kind of learn as you go. Um, and I've learned as an entrepreneur that that's really the best way to be. You need to just simply make a decision, go with it, and then see where it falls, and then pick up from there and find another better way of doing it, or stick to the way you are doing it if it is working for you. So I started Marketing Food Online with the idea of basically helping those who are looking to get into the food business. Uh, if it happens to be locally in the cottage food business, I can explain to you how that works and getting into how you can get online and, of course, selling on Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and all the big sites, as well as creating your own uh, website and getting your food out there. So I'm going to go over really quick these eight topics, these eight different things. And um, <clears throat> as always, if you guys have questions or any, any, um, anything that comes to mind you want to ask me, let me know. You can always email me, uh, of course, at marketingfoodonline uh, at yahoo.com or check us out, of course, on our YouTube channel. And uh, let's get into it. Now, this is one, I'm going to start off with what, of course, this is just my own opinion. The number one most important thing, and I know that there's a lot of sellers on all kinds of platforms, no matter where it may be, but more specifically about Etsy, that they don't, I don't want to say they don't take it seriously, but they don't take it in a sense of professionalism than setting up a store policy page, okay? When you lay out a really good refund and return policy, let's say, as part of your store policies, most of the consumers who customers who will come to your shop will feel more comfortable buying a product from you when you have an established return policy. That's like first and foremost, front and center, one of the best ways to attract a customer and to get them to trust you because that is the biggest challenge with uh, e-commerce of any kind no matter what you're selling, is actually getting the trust of the customer to therefore move move forward and, and make a, a purchase with you and pay you for a product or a service is always getting them to trust you. So establishing a policy, and you know, you don't have to, you don't necessarily need to make it like a uh, you know, 400 page documentary of any kind. Just simply explain to them, hey, at the end of the day, we make our stuff to order. If it's a handmade product or if it happens to be something that you're, you're reselling, we stand by what we, what, we, uh, what we make and what we sell. And for any reason, hey, you know what? You're not happy. Just return it to us and we'll refund it. Or we can substitute it and give you another item in its place. At the end of the day, we want you to be happy with the purchase and the product. And that's what we do. That's why we are in business. And that's, that's honestly the gist of it. If you want to keep it short and sweet and make it as powerful as you can and as strong as you can by just doing that, just say, look, you know, we stand by what we do. If you don't like it for any reason or if it happens to arrive damaged, we'll be happy to resend another one or we give you a refund. Plain and simple. Um, a lot of, you'll notice a lot of the big box retailers pretty much have a, a return policy the same. Now, of course, they are much bigger and, of course, they can return millions of transactions a week. Because they have those types of, 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 uh, of funds available, of course, and they're a huge, huge, huge business. I understand that. But if you are a small startup, and let's say you had 20 transactions in a week, and you had to return two of them by chance, or even one, uh, don't look at that as a problem. Look at it as a way that you could build trust with that customer. I personally have had uh, customers over the years, we've done hundreds of thousands of transactions, and... The, the two or three transactions here or there that get damaged or I have to refund, I don't hesitate. I don't even blink an eye. I just refund the money, 
and say, look, I'd be more than happy to – I'm looking to make the customer happy so they could come back in another time and, and buy some more products from us. And that's the way you need to look at it um, and because it's going to happen. It's not something that you can get around or it's never going to – you're never going to encounter that. That's not how it works. Uh, being on e-commerce is something that you're going to have just very similar situations as you do in retail brick and mortar. And um, not every customer is going to be happy with the product or not every customer is going to get it and it's not damaged. Things happen. Just make it right and move on. Don't sweat it, really. Um, so the other thing is uh, the payment options. Now, when you open up your Etsy shop, there's a lot of different ways that you can accept payments. Okay, And that's up to you to determine when you establish your shop is to make sure that you have as many possible payment options that are uh, given to you by Etsy for your customer to buy the, the product from. Make sure that you're signed up for each and every one of them. Of course, PayPal is one of them. They uh, accepting credit cards and such. Um, direct checkout, as it's called, the direct payment op options. Make sure that all of those that are pos that are available that can possibly be used are being used. Because the more more variety you give your customer uh, in regards to uh, checkout, it makes it easier for them to choose and pick, figure out what's best for them at that very moment. And that is what you really, really want. You want as many options as possible. Um, and you want your customer to be back if they know that um, they have the ability to pay with a lot of different ways, okay? All right. Um, other thing is, yes, so you, you, you may not, you may or may not uh, know, but email lists are huge and become very powerful over the past several years because of email marketing and the ability to keep in touch with the customers who come to you because if they come to you the first time and they buy something, then they're, they're there for a reason, Okay. So what you're looking to do is you want to accumulate an email list because that is going to give you an opportunity to email those customers on a regular basis and let them know, hey, you know what, i got a new, a new um, a sale going on. It's only for a week or two. Take advantage of it. I've got some new products coming out. They're going to be out, let's say, August 10th, you know, two, two or three days from now. They're going to be available. You know, that, that constant communication, staying connected to your existing customers, builds lifelong brand-following customers who will be back for your product or service over and over and over, and that's what you really want. It's great to attract new customers, but it's better to maintain the customers that you have and have them come back over and over. Because those are going to be the ones, by the way, just from experience again, they're going to be the ones who tell their friends, and their friends are going to be like, they're going to email you and say, oh my gosh, I had these, my, my friend who bought these from you, we had a party, they're fantastic, I would love to know where can I get some. So maintaining an email list is, is crucial it's just, it's just the, at the end of the day, it's like, it's like the blood, the, the, the lifeblood of any business aside from cash flow uh, to make sure that you, got, you have a list that you can keep in constant connection with. Okay, so another one is going to be, uh, this is always a challenge when you're, when you're just starting out. This has always been a challenge, and I noticed this whenever I first started. Um, getting reviews, getting your customers to review your product, and of course, you're looking to have a positive interaction. But that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, I can attest that does not happen all the time. Um, but customer reviews are, are really crucial for your business to grow. Why are they important? Because the future purchasers or the future customers who purchase products from you are going to look to those reviews if they've never bought from you, if they've never tasted anything, if they've never had anything. They're going to be the ones who look, you know what, five-star, two-star, three-star, one-star. Why did they get the stars that they did get? And they're going to take a look at the reviews. So, And I know... There's a lot of kind of, I don't want to say shady ways, but there are certain ways that you can, when you first start out, you can get family and friends to buy things from you and, and, and do that type of thing and, and, and kind of help you along the way in a sense. Um, I actually never did use that. I actually personally just opened my shop. And the first couple of customers who bought stuff from me, I went like above and beyond. I just maxed out my service to them. Uh, had the product arrive on time. I did everything I could to make sure it arrived perfectly. And if there was a problem, I hopped on that complaint immediately, resolved it, and took care of the customer and then moved on. So that is really the best way to do it. I would not recommend necessarily bribing people or getting people to leave your reviews. It's not a way to really honestly do your business. Um, but down the road, you'll definitely get your reviews and you can get up and running. Uh, but it's always, of course, tricky. <clears throat> excuse me, tricky at first to get those first couple or even those first few reviews. Now, the next thing may be kind of odd. This is kind of odd in the sense that you may, may be thinking, well, I'm in business to make money. Why would this be an issue? 
prices are too low, okay? Sometimes people set their prices too low, and there's a psychological effect to this. This is a, this is a psychology issue. It's really uh, when a customer comes to your shop, and I'll explain. If they see that you offer a product that's similar to other items, and let's just do a hypothetical that you have across the board, it's a $30 item. Everybody else that sells something similar is selling it for 30 but you're selling it for 15 okay? Your prices uh, can, can lead to a customer assuming that the quality of the product, it, it may be the same product, it may be similar, but the quality of it is something that, nah, if the guy's selling it for 15 bucks, there's got to be something wrong with it, that type of, of thinking. If you're looking to sell a product and there's multiple people selling it, Okay, exactly the same thing, right? Um, and it's very good likelihood your supplier is probably going to be the same as the others. I would recommend if you had it as a hypothetical, we had a thirty dollar product. I would go to twenty seven ninety nine. Okay, keep your price point if you want to, and you can afford it. I mean, in a sense that you don't want to cut into your margins, but if you can afford to put it just a couple of dollars below your competitors to get the ball rolling at least, to get people buying and getting your feedback and get the get up things up and running. Just go a couple dollars below. You don't need to cut it in half. You don't need to do something dramatic. Just go a little bit below because the psychology of it, the thinking of the consumer is going to be like, wow, well, this guy's got the same product as everybody else. But I can save a couple bucks on this, and he's got free shipping. Wow, that's fantastic. I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to go with this one, and I'm going to buy it. That's how most consumers do it. And I can tell you working in, in retail, the brick-and-mortar business, I was in there for 27 years, 28 years. Um, and I was a supervisor at a retail establishment for quite some time uh, I, I can tell you that customers think that way if prices are way too too low people are going to be skeptical they're not going to want to put their money down even if it's the exact same product it's kind of odd but it's just how it is okay so next moving on to the next one photos um, and I'm going to talk a little bit right here about specifically about why when you're selling food photography is I've always stressed this is of the utmost importance now, good photography for any product is important. My own opinion, when it comes to food, you got to have close-up, really almost, I want to say, delicious-looking images. The reason why I say that is that anybody can take a picture of a USB cable or a laptop. It's boring. You put it on a table. You make the lighting. You take a photo. It is what it is. In the description, you explain that it's got this processor, this such memory, blah, 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 blah. Well, when it comes to food, if you want to distinguish yourself, you want to set yourself apart from other people's food products that may be similar to yours, or if you're on Etsy you know, and you're trying to sell, let's say, chocolate chip cookies, and there's 100 people selling them, if that's your thing, if that's what you want to sell, make those pictures create the customer almost salivating and can't wait to buy your product. Close-up images, images that show texture, that show the, the flavor, in a sense, visually, those are images that you need to have. You need to get up on the product, get close to it. Don't distract it with a whole bunch of stuff around if it happens to be cookies, take a picture of the cookies. Nobody needs to see all the counter space, the, the shelving in the back. They don't want to see your oven, none of that stuff. Just take a picture of the product. And that way, it's going to allow the customer to see what they're getting. Then also take a picture of how it's packaged. How is it actually going to be shipped? Why is this important? I can, again, tell you from experience. I learned this pretty fast when I started out, is that when I shipped the product out, I didn't have initially have pictures of the packaging. Some people wanted to give the product as a gift, so they thought, they thought, they assumed that it was dressed up and fancy when it really wasn't. So that created some issues. So basically, spell it out visually for your customer from beginning to end. What does the product look like? How's it packaged? And, and then fill up as many, no matter what platform you're on, fill up as many possible images as you can. Okay? If you're allowed 10 images, put 10 images. If you have to even duplicate some of the images, and, and post them twice on there. Do it. Do it. Why? That's a, that is an issue for SEO and, and search engine optimization and a whole bunch of other things, which I'm not going to get into now. So um, lastly, let me see what else we got here. I'm losing track. I'm checking to look at my notes. We also, lastly, what we want to look at is your descriptions, okay? Specific descriptions with words that can drive a customer, again, to salivate over your food product. Words that are like crunchy, salty, sweet, filled with gooey, mm -hmm. caramel, bursting with flavor. These are the types of, of words you need, to, you need to spell out for your customer. Not every consumer has a great imagination, and that's fine. You need to fill that imagination 
with the words that you put in the description, okay? You can't just say chocolate chip cookies, you get 12 of them, it's fantastic. <clears throat> you want to tell them made with brown sugar, melts in your mouth, chewy, delicious, and gooey chocolate chip. You see what I'm saying? You can go through something like that where you're very descriptive because that, along with those images I just told you about, mm -hmm. are going to sell your product. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I'm going to wrap it up really quick here. Um, if this was helpful, as always, please do give me a big thumbs up. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I definitely appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. And let me know down below in the description if you guys want to talk about anything else on this topic. I've got a handful of new videos also that are going to talk to you about um, different platforms of, aside from Etsy in regards to getting your food product out there. So I will see you guys on the next podcast. Take care.